My name is Jeff Moore. I'm the superintendent of Hunterdon Central, and I'm here with Frank Picconi from the Center of Great Expectation. Uh, now, Frank, we've been doing some work together, Hunterdon Central and, and you, to, to look at culture and, and to do some training with teachers and staff um, around uh, some needs that we see. Uh, and so, first, before we, before we talk about all of that and connect it all in, tell me a bit about the approach uh, that you've been bringing to our staff, uh, the, the Nurtured Heart approach that, that you've been working with us on. Okay, well the Nurtured Heart approach is a, a, a social-emotional skills curriculum that basically talks about paying attention to what you energize. And what I mean by energize is, for example, when a parent uh, or a teacher spends a lot of time talking to uh, their, a, a student or their child about a problem, we're putting the spotlight on the problem. And, it, and what Nurtured Heart says is we need to be giving more of our relationship and more of our time to the things that we want to grow. Nurtured Heart says you all should, should, pay, you should address behaviors and concerns that you're having with your children, but you should do it briefly and, get, and really focus on recovery. So the approach teaches teachers to spend a lot of time in class appreciating you know, students behaving well, per, you know, working on their, working on their homework, uh, participating in class, and not spend so much time on uh, any disruptive, not spend too much time on disruptive behavior. So it's an approach that says, it really, the, in short, you, we want to grow the flowers and we want to starve the weeds. Grow the flowers, starve the weeds. So that's a really evocative Metaphor. T tell me a bit more about what that, that looks like. Well, for let's st stay a teacher. A teacher, when I ask teachers what they want, they want students who are focused, well-behaved, curious, uh, helpful, and those are great qualities. So I say, those are the qualities you want to grow. And then I ask them, what are the things that are, we call weeds, the things that you don't like that disrupt the learning environment? And they say things like, you know, not doing their homework, not paying attention, goofing off in class. And I say, okay, so we're going to grow the flowers by when you see the things you like, comment on them. I really love the way this class is engaged and they're all participating, or I love the way you're thinking. And what we find is what you notice and talk about grows. Students enjoy hearing about qualities they have and then they live those qualities. But if we spend a lot of time talking to them about behaviors and qualities we don't like, they begin to discover, they begin to see themselves as that's who I am. Mm -hmm. So we tell them, grow the flowers with detailed recognition, starve the weeds, address behavior you don't like, but don't make a big deal about it. Some kids get long conversations in the hallway and they get relationship around the negative aspects of what they're doing. So the approach basically says grow the flowers with positive recognition, starve the weeds by addressing it, but not with drama, not with a long speech and not with a big show in front of the class could, could embarrass the student. And the third part of the nurtured heart is let's have clear expectations let's have clear limits and let's set limits without drama and let's celebrate rules that are followed and these guidelines are very contrary to what I see in a lot of schools well, and I want to I want to talk about that a little bit because schools are an interesting case for for this kind of approach and and I want to chat through that a little bit but I want to want to first talk a little bit about where this fits into the kind of school and the kind of education that we want to offer to students uh, and, and why we think this is an important step and, and hear about it, hear about what it looks like from, from that, through that lens from you. So, so we've, we've been doing some planning in which we've identified uh, priorities like student wellness and, and, and like uh, individualized and personalized learning for students, powerful learning that they're really engaged in. Uh, those are two key priorities for us moving forward. And we've seen this kind of approach. Celebration, um, growing the flowers, starving the weeds, as, as almost like a threshold requirement for getting to those larger things that we want to see. Uh, but but one, of the, one of the things that we always think about with schools is schools are often known to be 
rigid, rules-riddled kinds of places. Um, just have relationships seems like such a, a, a fundamental, easy thing to do, but schools struggle with that. And, yeah. and you, what, what have you seen in your, in your travels that, that, that uh, gives you some insight into why and why this approach for schools? What, what, what is it that you see in schools that makes it a, a, not, not, a, not always such an easy proposition? Well, what I see in most schools is I sit in classes. I've been in over a hundred different schools in the past five years. And I sit in classes and I watch and I pay attention to certain dynamics. And one of the things that I notice is 90% of the time when a student is not behaving the way a teacher wants to behave, they comment on it. They address it. They have a conversation about it. And 90% of the time when a student is displaying the behaviors that they really want to see, they don't say anything. So what the experience for the student in class is, they get 90% of the of that time when they're misbehaving, they, they, they hear about it. And, and, when they're behave, and only 10% of the time when they're doing what they need to be doing, do they get a comment about it. The school environment becomes one of, that's not good, that's not what I want, that's not okay. And that impedes the um, engagement process, that impedes their learning process. Because I don't know about you, but if I was, if I was going on a date with somebody and 90% of the time they were telling me what I was doing wrong, I would not be having a good time. Uh, uh, and I would be kind of stressed and anxious. And we don't want our kids stressed and anxious because of what it does to their brain and to their ability to digest the material and grow and learn, which is what schools are all about. Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's more to come back to on that point too, where, where stress and anxiety fit into this uh, constellation of this approach I, I wanna touch on as well. I wanna, I wanna come back in there to just a, what, what it sounds like you're saying from a really fundamental point of view is that we're talking about kind of the balance of conversation and how much how much we're putting on one side of the scale versus the other and then ultimately what that can deliver in terms of what a, what a student might learn is is valued in the relationship is, right. is that is it that simple it, it is pretty simple we learn about who we are by what the world tells us we are there's a, there's a famous quote that says that, you know, my teacher thought I was brilliant, so I was. And I think that we, we want the best in our children, but we give our heart and we give our relationship and we give our conversation mostly to them when they are upsetting us and not living the values we want them to live. So if we, I think many, I was trained, I, I, I've raised my children before a nurtured heart. When you mess up, I'm gonna sit you down. I'm gonna have a long conversation with you. I'm gonna make sure you don't make this mistake again. But one of the messages my children might have gotten that I didn't intend was, if you want connection with dad, if, and, and, and you messing up gets it pretty quickly. And the other message they might get is he keeps talking about how rude I am. I guess I'm rude. Um, and I guess that's a problem, I guess. And, and, and that was not my intent. And I don't think it's parents' intent. We want our children to live out the best qualities that they have. We should focus our energy and our relationship on those qualities. So I think in the classroom, it creates a more relaxed environment. And if you have a student in class who's not paying attention and you keep pointing out, you're not paying attention, you're not paying attention, you're saying that publicly, you're announcing that about the child, they're feeling, and, and either they feel bad about themselves because I can't seem to pay attention, or they own, I'm somebody who doesn't need this class. You know, so I just think that the approach has been used all over the country, all over the world, and every time I bring it to teachers, they, they really enjoy it and parents enjoy it. It's very simple. Talk more in detail about the things you want to see in your child. Address the things you don't like, but not with a big speech and a big drama. And be clear about your expectations and clear about your consequences. And don't deliver them with a big drama because the more you scare your child or, or more intense you are, the less they digest the important information you want. And really, there's the, there's the, the commonality between parenting 
and school. We want our children and our students to digest the information and to, and to grow in, in the knowledge that we're sharing. And that can only be done with a relaxed brain. And, and it's interesting because you could take you know, some of the advice that you just encapsulated so quickly. You know, you know, give energy to the things, and as you were saying earlier, give energy to the things that you want to see grow. Uh, you know, don't give drama to the things that you don't want to see grow. Those, those are very simple things to say, and you could say that to a, a parent, you could say that to a person, and they can immediately take that into action and think about it and reflect on it. Uh, when you talk about doing that across a school, you know, the, it, it becomes more complicated <clears throat> in the sense that there's value to, you know, are, are we all talking about it in the same way? Do, can, can we measure it, uh, the impact that we're having and the progress we're making together? Um, so it goes from being this, this good advice that you give to a person to, well, what, what's the language that people talk about? What are the, what are the you know, zones of regulation I can, I can sort of offer as an example? What are, the, what are the tools in the toolbox that we use to really make this come to life across a whole school. What are, what are some of those kinds of things? Well, the first tool that I talk a lot about is being emotionally well-regulated. And what do I mean by emotionally well-regulated? Our emotions sometimes rise up and we get very excited and sometimes angry or intense or our, we get lethargic. So there's various zones we go through. A, a blue zone is when we're lethargic and tired and not focused. Many teachers have students who go through blue zones. A, a, a green zone is when we're at our best, we're at our focused, we can learn, we can comprehend, we, we are really alert and oriented. A yellow zone is when I'm getting anxious, maybe I'm worried about a test, I'm getting stressed, my heart rate is going up, I'm nervous or scared about something, or upset or, or, or intimidated. And the red zone is when it, we're out of control and we're potentially doing destructive things to ourselves and to others. We teach teachers to be aware of the zones that the students are in and to have an array of strategies and approaches. If you try to teach a blue zone kid geometry or history or, or, or science, they're not in the brain mode to learn. So we're saying teachers, when they're in the blue zone, we need to do some alerting and getting them more stimulated. Uh, when they're in the green zone, teach your way and, and celebrate and, and deal with the tough issues because they're at their best brain health at that point. When they're in the yellow zone, be good at de-escalating and get them back to the green zone. And if they're in the red zone, which I ho hopefully doesn't happen too often, but it does sometimes, know your protocols to de-escalate and maintain safety. And so teachers, and then we're also saying to teachers, how are you doing on your regulation? Because if I'm a teacher and I'm in a yellow zone because I'm stressed out about my class or stressed out about bills or stressed out about my life, um, I'm not going to be able to tune into the zone you're in because I'm too busy being anxious. So if the first thing I say is be well regulated yourself and that takes some skill and we teach the teachers that skill. Mindfulness, breathing techniques, getting away from what's stressing you out. Once you're well regulated, you can attune, be attuned to the student and you can be effective in helping them get better regulated. So many classes are beginning with some activities to deescalate. Um, getting up and moving around, uh, having brain breaks. But it's a whole new world when a teacher walks into a class and doesn't just start teaching, because if you have five blue zone kids, you've lost them. If you have seven yellow zone kids, and we've been asking some of the teachers who've been playing with these concepts, they've gone into the classroom and said, here are the zones, they're very simple. What zone are you in? And teachers have said, 70% of their class said yellow zone. And they said, okay, what are, you, what are you anxious about? And then had a discussion before we start giving you information that your brain will not digest in that zone. Frank, what you're talking about is this, there's this uh, partnership that goes on then through this, through, through this uh, model where you know, everybody has some of the same language to talk about where they are. And I could imagine too where you get to the point where students 
can self-identify not only where, they're, where they are, but some of the strategies to kind of come down. But it, it's interesting you talk about, and I've heard from teachers who've gone in and had those conversations as well, 70%, you know, 15 out of 22 students saying they're in the yellow zone and they're stressed out um, about something. Uh, and, and that's alarming because that's, that's in some ways what, what we know we have to, to, to face with a model like this. That not only is this a relationship building tool, um, but it's also a tool that we need to help create a less stressful environment. How does it serve that function, you know, to help not just by identifying, well, I guess just by identifying sort of how you can bring yourself down to the green zone, but just the larger picture of what does this relationship building do to that kind of, that kind of environment where 15 kids or 70% of the kids are yellow? I think what it does is it says, my job as a teacher is to model a well-regulated self. So I, first of all, encourage teachers, if you are feeling stressed out, to you can say to your students, I'm feeling a little stressed. It might be because I've asked three times for everybody to settle down and they haven't. It might be for other reasons. But I'm going to breathe a little bit, get myself into a better zone. And I celebrate teachers who have the courage to model that us adults are stressed out too. And so once they're in a well-regulated state, they have the ability to zoom in and see that their class has some issues that quickly can be dealt with. Sometimes just acknowledging, I know you're stressed, so let's all get up and just stretch a little bit and let's breathe a little bit. And, it, and the students realize you're, we're not like a machine where they're just feeding us information and we have to digest it, but we, that, that teacher understands that I'm stressed out. And for some of the kids, the stress could be worry about a test. Uh, it could be relationships, which we know at this age are crucial. It could be the hormones coursing through their body. It could be, am I, do I have enough friends? Whatever it is, it, this is a class that's going to recognize and help you calm and, and, and get into a good brain mode. And then we get to the teaching. And then we get to the teaching. So. There's two ways to go. I'm not gonna pay attention to my regulated state. I'm not gonna pay attention to their regulated state. I'm just gonna go through my curriculum and get through everything. And we have this wonderful education pouring over kids. Green zone kids are eating it up and 70% of the class is thinking, am I, am I gonna get into the right college? We're adding to their stress in those moments even, right? Absolutely. Making them deeper yellow. Yeah, because, yeah. They're, because we're not attuned. I keep using that word attuned and it's crucial. Human beings need to be in a well-regulated state so that they can attune to others. And, and, and they can attune to, this kid's pretty anxious right now. Maybe this isn't the time to call on him. Maybe I need to say to him, it looks like you're stressing a little bit. You want to go take a drink of water and, and, and just help. And the students, that, the students love that their teachers are tuned in they, they, students are coming into class sometimes and saying, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit yellow. I've got a big meet tomorrow or a big event tomorrow or we're going, you know, whatever. My mom's sick and, and they feel safe that I can, that we want to get the environment aligned so that education can be optimally delivered and digested and we can get maximum performance. And, and I want to I want to make clear too. So when I when we talk about this, uh, and and we've had a lot of conversations at school since since a, a training that we had in March and some work that you, that you did prior to that with a smaller group of teachers to to kind of get our feet wet. There's there's a feeling, and you must see it in all the schools that you visit, that 70% of kids in yellow must be something that you see, sort of out there, you know. And we know we know certainly that students talk to us about stress and parents talk to us about the stress that their students or their children are under. And I know as a dad, just if you're not here dropping this one off to, to, to do this expected thing, you're taking that one over there or this one has this issue, but you don't have time for it because of, you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's stress all around, but this isn't just tools to layer on top of that to say, all right, yeah, life's stressful. Here's how you deal with it. You know, there's also in this the answer to some of the concerns we have about 
you know, what's at the root of that stress, this chronic stress? What's, what's causing it? Where can relationships help diffuse it and create better understanding between people through being attuned? So we see that as well. We did a, and you know, because we've talked quite a bit about it, this survey that we did um, in the beginning of the school year, where mm -hmm. we found a couple of points from our parents and our students concerned us about you know, are relationships happening to the degree that we, that we need them to? Are, are, are kids feeling engaged in the work that they're doing? Uh, so, so beyond the tool set for, for dealing with the stress, what, what, what is it in this approach that helps sort of get at the roots of the stress, whether it's sort of the, the chemical physiological reaction of stress or just the relationships? What, where, where do you see it being beneficial there? Well, I, one of the things that I do with teachers and with parents is that I do some education on the brain. And what I talk about is that as we get stressed and as the stress lingers in our, uh, in our bodies, our brain, the interesting things happen in the brain. The part of the brain, the executive functioning, the cortex part of the brain, uh, that makes great decisions, that helps us make wonderful, brilliant decisions and manage our emotions, it actually goes dark the more stressed you get. And another part of the brain lights up, and that part of the brain is the amygdala, and which is our 911 fight flight center. So we're finding that the more stressed out a human being is, the more they move to become uh, reactive, impulsive, um, and uh, fearful and nervous, and they don't learn in those modes, and they don't perform well in those modes. So we're we are teaching our staff and our parents to uh, regulate, have regulation strategies to calm themselves down. So we're we're really putting an emphasis on keeping people in the right brain health. Uh, so that they can perform optimally and make the kind of decisions that are going to be good for them in their life. You know, I, I've been reading some fascinating science, and I've heard you talk with our teachers about it too, that, that you know, not only do these things happen inside of you and your brain, uh, whether, it's, whether it's the amygdala rising or, or executive function going dark or, or, I don't know, cortisol you hear about, you know, yeah. uh, but, but that that if it's not dealt with in relationships and, and on an individual basis, it becomes the culture of, of a space. Yes. And then beyond that, some fascinating stuff about, uh, through genetics, how, how this becomes sort of passed down yes. through family culture and potentially yes. even genetics. Yes. So, I, and I know some of this approach was built for, for, for students and for children and for adults who who have really severe challenges in, in their backgrounds, in their lives. But, but chronic stress is becoming this severe thing. And, yes. and uh, uh, it, it's really interesting that there are specific tools in this toolbox that can help, help individuals and, and whole, whole cultures kind of deal with this. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating to me. What are some of the most specific kinds of things that you find people latching on to most as, as little little tips or, or tools in this approach? What are some of the things that people just go, ah, yes, that, that changed my classroom or that changed how I deal with my children at home? What are some of the things that people come back to you and say, yeah, that really worked? Um, I think the idea of, um, I think the first thing is understanding that the behaviors that you're seeing that might be frustrating you in the students are not deliberate the student doesn't come to school and say, I hope uh, today I want to drive the teacher crazy or today I want to goof off. They come with the agenda to be successful. But because their, their cortisol levels are high, because they're stressed out, they, uh, they re they're, they're responding based on the mode of brain health that they're in. And if the teacher can understand that, they do this thing we call Q-tip. They quit taking it personal. They don't take the behavior personal so they can stay in a relaxed state. You know, I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, sometimes a student is, um, a student might be not paying attention and goofing off. And if the teacher is well regulated and attuned, they might assess that this student is really anxious 
and their approach would be to come at the student and say, looks like you're struggling with something, what's going on? If that teacher is not attuned and they see that as a personal thing that this kid is doing, they might say, listen, sit down and cut it out, which might escalate the, the student. So we're really talking about teachers are saying, if I can stay calm, stop taking it personal and understand that we are all trying to manage stress, I could respond instead of react. And I can be a great role model and keep everyone in a good regulated state and just get some great stuff going on here. So I just think that, um, I, I think that it's important for us to, to realize that, here's some, a realization that came to me in my own life. Every bad decision, every time I've said something hurtful to somebody I love, every time I've regretted a thing I've done in a relationship, it's when I've been in an escalated state. Mm. I've never been calm and nasty to people. Um, and I realized that if I can keep myself pretty well regulated, I'm going to have better relationships. I'm going to make better decisions. I'm going to have a better life. I'm not going to keep hurting myself by regretting the actions I did when I was in that escalated state. So I'm not saying we can't get escalated. I'm not saying that we have to be monks and meditate all the time. I'm saying I have personally experienced my life getting better and better the more I pause. And maybe that's a technique that I would mention. Teachers have said to me, thank you, Frank, for the pause. Pause when a student's pushing your buttons. Before you respond, pause and give yourself a chance to calm down so that you could respond effectively and write the educational environment and get engagement from that student. So pause is powerful. And, and I, yeah, I see that too. You, it, it's in a classroom, you're, you're always teaching. Yes. Every single second you're teaching, when you're correcting behavior in an inelegant way that's just triggering further escalation, you're, you're teaching, you know, everybody else. You're teaching that child, you know, and, uh, and, and in some way you're, you're creating habits in yourself as well that are, that are sort of imprinting on, on how you deal with stress. And, and you're right, you know, the pause, the breath, and I've, ta I've heard some teachers talk about, you know, not only in that, that moment pausing, taking the breath, calming down, but being um, explicit about it to, to the student. Yes. You know, this, I'm feeling a little, you know, whatever, you know, the conversation to say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing yeah. that. Uh, and then I come out of that able to react, which teaches, right? right. And the, the, the thing I've heard about this approach uh, in, di in different conversations over the time that we've, we've considered bringing it in, uh, and you addressed it, but I want to tie it into this part of the conversation. We talked about, um, you know, students, uh, students acting out and how you can deal with that calmly. What do you say to the person that says, oh, well, this is just a way that lets kids get away with things? There's a third stand in the nurtured heart. The first stand is do not energize negativity or you'll grow it. The second stand is energize everything that you want to grow in your child by giving it detailed recognition. The third stand, which is the forgotten stand, is absolute clarity. We, Nurtured Heart believes that kids need clarity about the expectations, clarity about the rules, and they need consequences. We're not against that. But here's the big difference, and here's where it, it mixes with regulation skills. If a student is in the yellow zone or borderline red zone, I am not going to say to them, you're gonna get suspended because I'm poking the bear. I'm poking the bear. And then when this kid says, I don't care, then I, then I get escalated because after all, I'm a teacher and they should be listening to me. And I start coming back at them. So now we have two yellow zone individuals going at each other. What we would say is, I'm gonna first de-escalate you. I'm not gonna talk about the consequence. Well, others may be watching saying, there, you're not holding them accountable. I will hold them accountable, but guess when? When I get them into the green zone, which might be for, it might take a while, but when I get them into the green zone, then we're gonna say, now let's talk about your accountability. 
you knocked over some desks, you said some threatening things, there are consequences for that, and we're gonna have a conversation about them and you're gonna have to serve them. But we're doing it in a well-regulated state. I'm gonna, and how many times I've heard teachers and parents say, the kid was wild and disrespectful and cursing me out, and then 45 minutes later, they're coming at you saying, I can't believe I did that, I'm so sorry. Because we're doing so much damage in the red and yellow zone. So a lot of times, I just don't want people to think, we pick and choose the time when we're most powerful and effective. If you're in the yellow zone, I gotta get you to the green zone, then we're gonna talk about consequences. Well, and, and, and certainly, I mean, what, what strikes me is that if you're, you're in the yellow zone, you're in the red zone even, you know, you're, you're, your executive functioning stuff is shut down, you're, you're in fight or flight mode, the only teaching, the only learning that's going on if two people are in that situation, the only learning that's going on is who's got power over whom? You know, who can, who can wield power and, and compel, you know, yeah. behavior, right? Who's gonna win and who's, who's gonna, gonna win? Lose? And, and we come down to the green zone together, then it's about why was that wrong? What did that do to our relationship? Yeah. Where can we repair? How yeah. do we move forward? What are the consequences yes. that have to be served? And, and what we found in beginning, just beginning this conversation in the, over the past several months, uh, is all of a sudden you start to see as a school, you know, where are our larger structures pointed? So everything from discipline policies to bell schedules to the, the sound of our bell, which you know, you, <laughs> you've sort of shown a light on here, how, how jarring some of these things and, and how, how, how amenable they are to the yellow zone sometimes. I mean, do you see that in school? Do you see schools uh, begin to approach this with relationships, kids with kids, teachers with kids, teachers with teachers, yeah. administrators, and then they start to kind of pull threads and go, wait a minute, what else is out of whack here for this to really come to life. Is that something that you see? I think that one of the things that is the problem is the leaders, the teachers and the leaders of schools are very stressed out as well. Mm -hmm. And they have important, they have to construct the well-regulated environment, but they have to do it while all the pressures continue to happen. So I think this thing that we're doing together is very powerful, but we have to respect the awesome challenge. Mm -hmm. I often say changing a culture as, as pressured and time sensitive and rule oriented as schools are, it's, we, we must have a well-regulated leadership and workforce because we have to have important conversations mm -hmm. about those things you just mentioned. But if I come into a conversation about the schedule that we have, uh, the way we work our classes, and I, I get agitated and escalated with you, we're not going to have as productive right. conversation as when we say, let's reset ourselves. And we, we're, so in order for the people who are shaping the school, the community, the parents, the school, all working collaboratively to shape the culture of the school, we have to be able to talk about sensitive issues mm -hmm. and stay well regulated. And so that to me is the challenge, um, is how do we create a well regulated environment when we have hot issues and, and very strong opinions. We do it by understanding that to get to the promised land, we have to stop sometimes. And I've had this in, when I was working at Rutgers and we were really embedded in this concept, we would stop meetings and say, we're, we need to reset. We're way off topic. People are f getting red in the face. Let's just breathe for a bit and get back to, and that is what's gonna get us the brainstorming to make the culture change to a better regulated environment, a more powerful and potent relationships and learning. That's, that's the real challenge. So Frank, we've talked about some really big issues, some specific practices, but how they hook into these large questions about relationships, about stress, uh, about larger organizational practices. You know, one thing that, that we know, as we, we knew as we went into this, was we were gonna start 
with teachers working with students, but we knew that it was going to have to spread beyond that. And that's part of the reason we're talking today, so that folks can hear what, what we're doing together. Uh, and, and we know that, that we start pulling threads on who else needs to be in this conversation, that, that it, it was going to scale up very quickly. Uh, and and um, that's, with, with a school this size, where you start and where you go next is, you know, it sounds like in some ways there, there is no wrong answer to any of that. It's just go next, yeah. right? Is that? Yeah, I, I think just we, if we can stay well regulated and we can reset ourselves when we get escalated, because we have important, powerful things to talk about, then we, have a, we are going to have the building blocks of accessing the frontal cortex, access, accessing the brilliant part of our brain, and, and really make the right decisions to create the optimum environment. I, I really think, and so, and boy, I, th I, I can't wait to get to the students. Because I would, would like to see the students learning to grow their greatness and not energize a fellow student's goofiness and to understand clarity. And I would love to get to the parents, to the families, uh, who I just think um, they feel they're, they're so passionate about what's best for their children that that passion sometimes spills over. And I know this personally, that passion spills over and we get really intense and that intensity, the more intense you get, the more your, your, your message gets distorted and the intensity becomes the issue. So, I, you know, my message for parents is think about the things, the qualities you want to grow in your children and notice them when they're happening and talk to your children about their wonderful work ethics. Talk to your children about their em emotional intelligence. Talk to them about their passion and their dedication. And when they do things that you're not happy with, address it, but make it more like a, a referee address as a, a, a violation in football. They don't yell. They don't scream. They simply say, you're out of bounds. Here's your consequence. And we're, let's get on with the game. And, and, and I think that you, I think you can see, I know you can see that if I can't manage my emotions and, and get myself de-escalated, I'm not going to be able to make those conscious choices to grow the great qualities and not feed the weeds. So they're connected. And I think that's why emotional regulation skills and working with your children and delivering the nurtured heart to grow the greatness, you can't choose what to grow if you're in an escalated state. And, and beyond that too, I mean, I think the, 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 the basis of everything that we do in schools is relationship. Yes. And, and if we're not approaching the relationship at all levels of the organization, in all conversations up and down and sideways, we're always teaching. Yes. You know, and if, if we're not modeling the best that we can do in relationship to solve problems, to work together toward a goal, to, to, to empower each other, then, then we've, we've lost something. Yeah, uh, that, that makes a, a lot of sense to me. Thank you so much, Frank, for, for chatting with me and, and talking through and, and, and just giving everybody an opportunity to hear uh, what it is that we've been working on and, and what we're excited about moving forward as big as it is, uh, just how, how necessary and how, how invigorating it is. Thank you yes, so much. My pleasure.